Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bench Fuel Visionaries podcast. I'm your host, Fred Schonberg. On today's show, we have Niall Hardy. And Niall is the co-founder, COO, and CMO of All Real Nutrition. Uh, Niall started his journey in a small kitchen in Ireland, creating nutritious protein bars made from real food ingredients. Uh, and under his leadership, All Real Nutrition has expanded to over 1,600 stores across Ireland and the USA, emphasizing sustainability through compostable packaging and ocean cleanup initiatives. Uh, in this episode, we're going to explore how Niall's vision has driven the company's growth since we first met him quite a while back now uh, as a participant in the Board BIA Innovation Program that Venture Fuel ran to help Irish startups and, and uh, scale ups enter the US market. So please join me and enjoy this episode with Niall Hardy. Niall, welcome back to the show. So good to uh, get to see you again. Thanks so much, Fred. It's a, a pleasure to be speaking to you again. <clears throat> Remind our listeners, what is All Real Nutrition and why did you start it? Sure. And pardon to your podcast guests, they're probably not so used to an Irish accent, so I'll try and keep it a little bit slower than I'm used to talking. <laughs> <clears throat> All Real Nutrition, so uh, we're what we call like a real food or clean label lifestyle nutrition brand, and we try to create kind of better for you, better for the planet products. It started, um, I started making protein bars in my home kitchen in 2016. Now, as you can guess, I'm based in Ireland uh, from my accent. And our protein bar market over here is much different than what it is in the US. We have very, um, very kind of artificial protein bars with a long list of ingredients and so on. And I wanted to create something that was clean label that actually tasted good because some of our natural products over this side, you know, that, that they really don't taste that great. And also uh, match the nutrition of some of the more artificial or more highly processed protein bars. Um, so, you know, it's a, a, a typical story of with a blender in my kitchen and created a whole bunch of different recipes until I got one that people actually liked. Um, I went to a farmer's market and I remember standing there quite nervous going, <clears throat> is anybody actually going to spend money on this? And someone came over and I said, oh, look, it's my first sale. They said, here's a 10 euro note. Hold on to it. I'll just buy a bar. And I said, I could. So th they said, no, no, take it. Absolutely. So at that point, I was like, oh, my God, someone just gave me money for this thing that I've uh, just made. OK, we're on to something here. And from there, we developed the brand, launched it into a couple of local stores. I got a, a facility, um, which was a really startup facility, um, <clears throat> set up with a blender, a table, a little rolling pin and a tray. And I used to go in there at 4 a.m., roll out some protein bars, pack them up and put them in the boot of my car and drive around to some stores and just start selling. And that's really how it was built, uh, one kind of store at a time. And I suppose now we're, uh, we're in selling in over 1,600 stores across Ireland uh, and the USA. Uh, we've got an e-commerce business with a team of 15 people. And yeah, it's been one heck of a journey. Man, so I, I want to ask you about that growth uh, and how it's grown from your kitchen. But I haven't even told you this in any of our exchanges. I was coming back. Uh, from a client trip, uh, and I went into uh, in New York City, uh, you know, Penn Station, where the sort of Amtrak rolls in, uh, and I went to grab a, you know, just a coffee at the end of the day to kind of. Uh, it had been a long. It was an early morning that day, and I go and sitting in front of me, uh, I went to a juice juice bar, like it was like a press juicery, I believe. Your bar was sitting there at the checkout, and I was like. Man, I remember our first conversation. I remembered your story about, you know, kind of rolling out the bars. And I was like, here you are in the US in this like prime time, like commuter area with like a lot of competition. And there was your bar, like, like first thing to be sold uh, in, in this location. So I thought it was a pretty cool moment. I took a picture of it that I got to send you. Yeah, <clears throat> that is so for real for us as well, you know. Um... One thing being in your home market, Ireland is what, 5 million people? It's really small and it's actually very hard to build a food brand here because it's just not the scale of people. But in the United States, when we first saw our bar on the shelf, that was a real pinch me moment. Like, oh my God, we're actually onto something here. 
and hearing anecdotes like people seeing our product in different places, it, it's really never going to be lost on me because I know how hard it worked to get to where we are. Um, and yeah, that's uh, it's pretty surreal at times when you when you get those kind of feedback and stories. Yeah, it was it was pretty cool to to see. So let me ask you this, and I, I know there's not just one answer, but what was your biggest challenge uh, to scaling to where you are today, knowing that more are going to come? But uh, can you at least talk a little bit about some of those hurdles that you had to overcome? Sure, there's been a bunch, right? Um, so like early on, it was product development. Okay, um, getting the product from my home kitchen to being able to produce at a commercial level that hit all the technical parameters, nutritional parameters, getting all the right, uh, you know, suppliers set up and getting our recipe right, so on. And uh, that was the first part. Then, as, as you'd mentioned, we've plastic free home compostable packaging. Not a lot of brands use that. And why we wanted to do it was. You know, FMCG brands do contribute a lot of single-use plastic. That's often not recycled in the right way. And we just thought there had to be a better way. And we wanted to make a stand against that. So we found, after a lot of research, a supplier who could create packaging that's certified plastic-free. Um, and to get that packaging to run in our machine and to get deliver the barrier properties to to put it on the shelf so you know it can sit there for a number of months for a customer to pick it up that was another big challenge for us um and we've had to make innovations in that over time but thankfully we've got it to a point where we've got a really good shelf life on the product um then the next thing was selling our first million bars getting to that scale uh, and that seemed like so far away we kind of broke it down going, right, we got to sell 83,000 bars in a month. Do that every month for 12 months, and then we're at a million. And uh, that, was a, that was a real challenge. And getting to that point was, was quite tough. Now, if, we, if, if I had a month like that now, I'd nearly lose my hat because, you know, we're doing much, much more than that now. Yeah. But getting to that point was a real challenge. But then really was... When you get to that level is getting the finances of the business really right to scale and you know you, like in the business um and we're telling our marketing story our background we're doing all these accelerator programs about building a brand but ultimately the finances are what drive a business on and they have to be right if you don't rule the finances the finances will rule you and uh, on a fast ticket to and uh, out of a business right so that's been a that was a big challenge for us was getting our business to a gross margin that will allow us to scale and uh, to hire a really experienced uh, person that's now on our head of finance to make sure that we're tracking everything properly. So when we're selling and doing all the right things, that our profit and loss account is good, um, that we're tracking gross margin or margin after sales costs and all those things. <clears throat> and ultimately that we're getting to a point where we're positive EBITDA and all this other stuff. And all these terms are things I'd never even heard of when I right. first started. So uh, it's been a real journey for sure. And uh, now that we're out the other side of that and we've got all those right pieces and we're ready to scale, I mean, that's a really exciting point because you've got product market fit, your business has got the right numbers to scale, then it's either growing it sustainably or bringing on finance and, and really going for it. And we're kind of at that point now. So so let me ask you this as a founder. One of the things uh, I, I had a, a guest on, I don't know, maybe a month ago, uh, and we were talking about the difference of being a founder to a CEO, like that transition, right? Because when you're, you're rolling bars at 4 a.m., you're also the sales team, you're the marketing team, and you're teaching yourself the finance piece. Right. You might not call it EBITDA or maybe you did, but like you're you're doing the the QuickBooks, you're doing all the things. And I've found a lot of founders as they start to scale, it's easy for them to invest in like the sales team. Also, maybe not as hard to invest in marketing because they see it. It looks good. It leads to more sales. But hiring somebody in finance feels like something you've sort of figured out already to a degree. You know, you're not great at it, but like you figured it out. Talk to me about that decision to go, oh, I'm going to invest our our money 
here on a back, I'll call it back end resource. I know how important it is, but I, I think, do you understand what I'm getting at? Like that, that yeah. moment of like, oh, how do we, how do we start spending money on things that maybe are not a direct drop to the bottom line? Yeah, so that, that is a challenge because you're also paying an accountant and a bookkeeper and all these people. Um, but ultimately, you know, we made the decision, right? We need to get to our million euros in sales. And at that point, we need to get someone on who really understands uh, numbers. You cannot scale doing everything yourself. <clears throat> and ultimately, you have to fire yourself at a certain point and bring someone in who's much better than you. Yeah. Could we afford to do that day one? Absolutely not. Could we actually acquire a, the talent to actually deliver on us at day one? They wouldn't come to us because we, we just weren't big enough. Um, but you know, th there is a part of practically bringing stuff on. And you know, I've, I've now been, uh, um, <clears throat> I'm now CEO of All Real Nutrition. And that was a bit of a transition within the team and restructuring. And ultimately, now that we've got a management team, so my co-founder, Ross, he's our chief commercial officer. We've got a head of operations and a head of finance, and we've got a really good ma management team for those main kind of four areas. Yeah. That, that's been a real transition from going to the entrepreneur phase to a scaling business phase. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, mindset shift. Uh, so let me ask you this. I, I, I mean, I saw you guys were on the hot 100 startup list. Uh, you know, some people estimate that functional food, health and wellness space uh, could be upwards of $5 trillion as an industry. How, what makes All Real unique uh, and positioned to kind of meet consumers in this, this moment in time, this opportunity? So I'll answer that in kind of two ways. Yeah. One, you know, we are the number one natural bar brand in Ireland, but our journey is not done here yet. We still have a couple more retailers to, to come in. We're building up the business, then hiring more people in so that can self-sustain before we go to America. Why am I saying that? Because our differentiating factors in this market are a little bit different than our differentiating factors in the United States. Interesting. So for, for, for example, we have a lot of highly processed protein bars here. We're, we're, we're the only one delivering a real food offering with the high protein, um, high fiber, uh, better calories and so on. So we've got a real strong point of difference in that sense. But in the United States, we've got a, a USP that we take for granted here in Ireland. We, we're using an, a premium Irish grass-fed milk protein. It is quite literally the best dairy on the planet. I'm sure you've heard of Kerrygold butter. Yeah. Um, our milk is coming from the exact same cows. I can actually look out the window of my uh, office here and see the cows uh, that act, that contribute to the milk into the uh, um, into the facility that processes it into our, our powder for us. And have it, you know, and looking at how, you know the U.S. dairy because it's such a massive industry, right? And you know the the the, the Irish dairy is typically, you know, 60% less CO2 emissions than the global dairy index. You know, we've got higher nutrients in our dairy from um, CLAs and carotenes. And that's what really gives that gold kind of tinge to our butter or that gold tint to our butter. Um, so we're coming to, to, to the US and we're looking at the protein bar market and we're seeing there is some dairy bars, but they're typically kind of value protein bars driven. <clears throat> And most of the, the kind of key players are <clears throat> plant-based, read ingredients, so on. Yeah. And our point of difference in the US is that we're bringing a premium grass-fed Irish milk protein to the bar aisle. I mean, if you're in a sprout store, for example, you can go and have a look <clears throat> at, the pro at the protein powder section and you'll yeah. see grass-fed whey as a big claim and the premium. We don't see that in the bar aisle. And that's really been our point of difference um, as an, on an ingredient basis. Our next point of difference is consumers want more sustainable packaging and they want to support brands that will make it easy for them to contribute back to the planet. So 
with our plastic free packaging it's certified home compostable or compostable as you guys would say <laughs> um, so if you have a home compost thing uh, you can put it in your compost heap it biodegrades within 26 weeks uh, leaving nothing but carbon and biomass which is what any piece of fruit or veg does so it, it, it's it's real sustainable in that sense and also we've got a partnership uh, with a non-profit organization called plastic bank so we donate a portion of every single sale of an all real bar to plastic bank and that money pays for collectors in areas where ocean plastic is at its worst um, so uh, there's areas of Brazil, Cambodia, Egypt, and a lot around Indonesia. And uh, typically local fishermen in those areas have lost, uh, you know, they, 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 they literally can't fish the, the plastic, there's too much plastic in the ocean. So we, they pay for collectors to collect plastic, recycle it, and then they sell it back on. So like every single bar that we sell stops the equivalent of one plastic bottle from entering the ocean. And the end of this year, we'll have stopped over 10 million bottles. So we're wow. really excited by its big impact we've made. Uh, and also, it, it, it provides healthcare fun, funding, um, education for people in those communities as well. So it's, a re like, it's not the reason we set our business up, wasn't to end ocean plastic, but we wanted to make an impact with our business while we grew. Yeah, I love that. I, I have a question as a founder. So... I remember first meeting you, we were doing uh, the, the accelerator with Board Bia, uh, and my first thought was, you guys' bar was so good, and it was a clean label. I'm like, this is great. And you were talking about, uh, you know, making the, the packaging, uh, you know, completely sustainable. And in my head, I was like, whoa, you're trying to do too many things. Uh, this will sell just fine without the sustainability angle. And I remember you saying, no, this is really important to me. We're doing this thing. Uh, and now it is such a differentiation. And it's hard. It's hard as you firsthand ex had experience figuring out how to do that. What? Talk to me about why you dug in on that uh, and said, this is important to who we want to be as a business, even though it wasn't the easiest path to market uh, and certainly wasn't the easiest choice to make. It definitely wasn't. You know, our, like I mentioned, our packaging doesn't have the same barrier properties. So we actually formulate our, our recipe a little bit different to allow for, for our packaging. So that's been uh, significantly hard. And thank you for saying our bar tastes really good. Yeah. I really believe so. I think it's one of the best tasting bars, but nobody's baby is ugly. So <laughs> I admit that too. Um, but why do we make that choice? So Ireland is a small island country. We're surrounded by water. And me and my co-founder grew up surfing and we just saw plastic coming into our beaches all the time. And when we were looking at creating the All Real brand, we wanted to do something better for the world. And at the time, a lot of brands were looking at the carbon credits and so on. And we kind of just took a step back and went, what does the FMCG industry contribute more than anything and that's single-use plastic i mean people at convenient lives it, it, it really like the, the packaging has helped us grow as a society and so on but we wanted to create a slightly better way and help minimize that impact so we thought okay first of all our first step was to get plastic free packaging and then we wanted to double it up again and try and get uh, an impact partnership that help prevent ocean plastic. So every time you buy an all real bar, not only are you purchasing one less piece of plastic, you're actually paying someone to take plastic out of the ocean. So it actually each product has a double impact. And uh, that just felt like the right thing to do. Now our head of finance looks at the bill that comes in uh, once a quarter for that and does question it, but hey, that's why we built our, our business. And also that's why we built such a loyal uh, following, both in Ireland and the USA. Um, the, the US consumers really love the, the product and our positioning. And we get reached out like almost 10 to one compared to our Irish customers, the amount of US customers that reach out to us, you know, supporting the brand, loving the product and, you know, because the product is a little bit different. We produce it here in Ireland, not with the typical ingredients you guys have in the US. 
Um, so it is a little bit different in terms of texture, flavor, so on. So again, it does actually feel like a truly different product and customers yeah. are just really getting behind that. Yeah, I love it. So let me ask you this, what's, what's next for you, for the brand? Uh, what, what's in front of you? So we've, we've kind of got a, our next two steps, okay, I'll, I'll go there. Right now, um, we're launching with, we're in pretty much all of major retailers in Ireland, bar two. We are launching in one of them in January and the other one later on this year. We want to get the Irish market built and hire in a team to manage that. Then um, we, we've, we've kind of used the US um, to see how our product would sell over there. You know, when we design our brand with the logo, we, we based it kind of on North American athleisure wear brands like North Face and so on. Because we had the Irish dairy, it was always in our vision to go to US. And this is not the way Irish brands are told to go. It's Ireland, UK, Europe. Don't go over to the US. It's, it's too hard. But actually, when you have a product that's different and doing really well, it, it makes sense. And that was part of our thinking from the inception of the brand. Now we're listed in eight, 900 stores in America. Our hurdle rate or whatever, you call it velocity, right? We call it rate of sale. Our yeah. rate of sale is far over the hurdle rate. And uh, right, and uh, we're now about to launch our online direct consumer business uh, in the first start of 2025. And then in H2 2025, we'll be launching Amazon. And we're really getting the online sales built. So phase two is going all in on the United States retail market because we really believe our product's differentiated. It offers something different from taste, texture, nutrition, sustainability. And our design just looks really good. It just sells on the shelf. And we just want to create a whole suite of everyday nutrition products. And, um, you know, like we're not just going to be a protein bar brand long term. You know, it's why we're not called All Real Bar, we're called All Real Nutrition yeah. because we, we want to really deliver that. Um, and, you know, like typically what you see in the, the health space, you have those like core users who are, you know, purely focused on muscle building and they're really into the science of everything that goes into their body. You have your gym goers who are like not bodybuilders, but focused on kind of performance and muscle building. We appeal more to two other groups, which are like active consumers, which are more kind of fitness enthusiasts, interested in a broader kind of active nutrition goal and lifestyle consumers who are, you know, um, stopping off in a gas station, want to grab something that's not really bad for them that can help fuel their needs. And, you know, and they've got many needs, including kind of healthy living and wellness. So we kind of steer sports nutrition have the real sciencey core side of it. We're more in an active nutrition, you know, yeah. simple ingredients. You can read the back of the pack and understand what it is. But you can also look at our nutrition and go, okay, there's 180 calories, but 16 grams of protein. That's more protein than the other bar and a lot less calories. So that's got to be better for me. And look at the fiber. It's really high fiber. Gut. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's our next move is, is to bring our product and spread it across the United States. I love it. So where can people go uh, that want to buy buy some of your product or to learn more about what you guys are up to? So our main listing in the United States right now is in Sprouts Farmer's Market. We're in 392 stores across the country. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we're also in a bunch of retailers in uh, California, uh, like Laysons, Fresh Time, so on. We're in the pressed uh, juice chain across yeah. the United States. But we're launching our website, allrealnutrition.com, shortly. So we've, the website is built. We're getting the 3PL set up. We have our supply chain on the way. Um, so that website will be launching soon. And if anyone wants to follow us or drop us a DM, you get us at Instagram at allrealnutritionusa. And I'll likely be the one answering that DM. So uh, drop me a message and uh, we can have a, a chat. You, you might be CEO, but you're still the founder, right? You're still, you're still answering the Instagrams. Oh, 100 percent. I, I leave voice notes to customers all the time. I love connecting with customers, hearing what they love about the brand. And also if they have some concerns about different things, I, love, I, I have an open conversation with quite a lot of people 
And I typically do it in transit between meetings so on. Um, because I, I just love learning more what do the customers want. And that also helps me feel, what, right, what's our NPD pipeline going to be? I know what these guys are looking for. I know what we can deliver. Now, can we match those up and bring the next thing out? I love it. Well, Niall, thank you uh, for your time, for everything you're doing. Uh, I am not joking. The bars are delicious. I'm a huge fan and have been from day one. I'm excited for all your growth. Um, and keep up the good work. Looking forward to seeing you soon in person. Thanks so much, Fred. Thanks for having me on the Venture Fuel podcast. And we just hope to spread the amazing all-real nutrition bar all across the United States. And thanks for supporting us on that mission.